I have to read the disclaimer? I do not, but I really wish I did, have financial interests in any of the products that have to do with my talk or any companies offering grant monies for this uh, continuing dental and medical education program. Thank you. The lawyer, my buddy lawyer, makes me read the uh, disclaimer. Okay. You know, um, I just never get tired of hearing Sherry speak. She has spoken to the Academy several times. I just wanted to comment on a, a couple of things. One is the thank yous. Okay. We average about, I have a small practice. We average about 20 new patients a month. Every patient I write a thank you to whoever, you know, when they come in, we always say thank you. Who can we thank we're referring? So we have a very nice card that says thank you on it and thank you for our confidence in us. But then I always write a sentence and they put down who, you know, who the person they referred and I say thank you so much for referring so and so to us. I appreciate it. And I do that for every new patient. So I do write a personal note. See, yes ma'am. No, they, what they do is they take the cards, they paper clip the name of, see, they have the envelope made out to the patient, it's going to, to the person it's going to. Then they have a little paper clip with the, who they sent. So I sit there and I say, oh, thank you, so-and-so. So I handwrite a line on every card. Okay. So, and, and I, I learned that beforehand, but, but see, I totally agree with Sherry. Okay, and um, as far as the whole insurance things go, if, if you understand how, and we're gonna go over how I do my practice, if you understand, if you educate the patient properly, they never quibble about insurance because they're already understanding they're already understanding that what I'm all about is the best possible health care, the best possible dental care. And they know insurance companies are out to make money. They're going to try to pay as little as possible. People aren't stupid. They know that. But what you get them thinking, if you do your treatment plan correctly, right? and this is where we, as staff members, you need to get you need to talk to your doctors. Now, first of all, the role-playing thing. Here's the way I handle it. Oh, yes, question. Do you do the presentation? I do the case presentation. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to run through it. I do the case presentation myself. I never talk about money. In fact, I don't even know what my fees are. The staff member goes over money. Never the case, I always present the case, always. And every, every person, even if they don't need any fillings, gets a half hour consultation. Because I haven't found anybody that doesn't have periodontal disease at some level. I haven't found anybody, well I shouldn't say, 80% of the people need, need a night guard. Okay, so at the very least I'm gonna to talk to them about periodontal issues and a night guard. But I will sit down with every single person and I write up a written report. Okay? How are we doing back there, those people who just came in? So nice to see you. Make sure you're very vocal, okay? Because I really want to look good on the video. So you have you know, so the more you hoot and holler and and the louder you are, the more buttons I'll give you. Okay. <laughs> I love that enthusiasm. Did she start on the cocktails already? <laughs> so anyway, insurance isn't an issue in my office, but I will also say this. They know, they collect information when the patient calls as a new patient. They put it into the computer and they, can, they know all the insurance companies. They know all the benefits. So they have it all there. So after I present my treatment plan, it is all printed out. What the cost is, what their insurance will pay. That is given to them. They know. And you know what I tell them? After, and, and remember, the whole thing is, and you guys remember this from Thursday, when you finish presenting your treatment plan, the first thing the patient should say is, 
that's it. If they ask you about money first, you blew it. Because that means you didn't convince them of ideal dental health and what they need. So the first thing they'll say is, wow, how, when can we get started on this? When do you have an opening? Now, again, I'll tell them I'm an idealistic realist. And I say this to them. I say, I know we got to deal with finances and money. I say, I'll tell you what. I have some people that just know everything there is to know about insurance. I'll send them in, and they can take care of you. We also work with a company called Care Credit. They can apply online. That's wonderful. And once I convince them, so if they don't, you know, I mean, we, I don't like, we don't like setting up finance plans. We're not a bank, but we provide care credit for them. They apply online, they get the money, bingo, they get the dental work done. We have 90%, 97% acceptance of our treatment plans. I think most dentists would die for that. Okay, so let's go through and we can alter as much as you want and I'll take you through how we do something and just some things to start off with. Biological dentistry, we went through the definition in Thursday's class. You know, this, this is, I am the, there are three members of the academy in Cincinnati. I am the only one that advertises myself as a general dentist practicing biological dentistry. We have patients, now you know how it works in most dental offices, it's, it's the closer you are to the dentist, in fact, you know what, we canceled our yellow page ad. It cost us $500 a month for our yellow page ad. Guess how many people we get from the yellow pages? Maybe two a year. Is that cost productive? Guess where they come from? Internet and referrals from the physicians I work with. So why would I have an ad in the yellow pages? And guess what? You know this. If you're a biological dental office for a while, the people that come in from the yellow pages, they're the worst. Because they're looking for the dentist that's close to them, and you give them the whole presentation, and they go, huh? So you don't want them. So why would you spend $500 a month with an ad in the yellow pages? I just saved you guys $500 a month. And I will take kickbacks. I'm not proud. Everybody on the staff, and I totally agree with Cherry, they, you, if you have, now first of all, the people that have the mercury fillings, I don't want to point them out, but please turn your head when you exhale so you don't contaminate the rest of us. You know what my first thought is? Is one, and, I, and I'm not trying to make you feel bad, who, the ones that have it. And I only saw you, I'm, I'm sorry I'm looking at you. I know more than one person raised their hand. Okay. You get an extra button. You know, it, it's the type of thing that the first thing I thought about is, that was my first priority, is to get the mercury out of my staff's teeth because they're like family. And I thought of two things. One, is your dentist here? I don't want to get in trouble. What? Okay. I just want, I don't want to get in trouble. Her dentist isn't here. Okay. Either he doesn't care enough, or you don't care enough. Because when I learned about this, I got him out in a New York second, and nobody is in my staff. And you know what? Patients all the time say, do you have any mercury fillings? And guess what? What does it say if your staff member goes, yeah, I still have some? then you didn't buy into the program. So make, them, make him or her take him out first thing. And guess what? I booked the appointment during hours. We don't do it on a day off because they're my family. <laughs> now, I had a dentist contact, actually they didn't contact me personally, they called Kim and complained because I talked about how I take care of my staff and he was rather cheap and his staff started to bother him. So I have to be careful about what I say. My idea is you don't have employees, you have a biological dental team. So I won't go into specifics about money, but let me say this, the best way to get now, now understand, first of all, you gotta find quality people because you can't bribe quality people. But man, they appreciate being rewarded. 
Okay? You get people that are working hard. You can't pay them to work harder because it, it makes the day go faster. They enjoy their job. They appreciate what they're doing. You know, that kind of quality person. But man, when you reward them, it's important. So there's a certain amount where to pay the bills and everything over that they get a percentage of. And guess what? I don't get a bigger cut than them. We split it equally. Do you think I have a hole in my schedule? <laughs> because it's their office too. It's their money. It's not like they're just making money for me. We are a team. And I tell them every day, I can't do it without them. I need them. And they're all fantastic at what they do. And so, um, you know, like what Sherry said, um, I gave him a challenge. If, if you, we're being videotaped. And look at, see, now look at that. Now, you see, now you're on the video. Now he's going to have to go edit. There's going to be a little blank spot. You're going to be your head going by. Give me your, give me your button back. <laughs> so, so I said, look, you know what? We have the opportunity to have the best year we ever had. And here's what we'll do. I'll do something special if you can get to a certain amount by July. Okay, and you guys heard this before because this is kind of a repeat, but yes, they did it. And I rented a limousine, I picked everybody up with the champagne, and we went to a special restaurant, and I gave them each $750 in cash, and boy, they loved it. Plus, now to see, this was special. They all got a very expensive piece of jewelry. So it's a memento. See, cash gets spent, and very rarely does the $20 bill I give them come back, and they go, oh, that was the one he gave me. <laughs> but the jewelry, they wear all the time. Okay, now, I know nothing about jewelry, so of course I have my office manager do it, and it worked out great. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so we're talking about creating a team. And let's face it, who here, raise your hand, get up, raise your hand, who here likes to replace staff members? Isn't that fun? No, everybody hates it and it costs a lot of money. So if you got quality people, it makes sense to treat them well. Make them part of a team. Give them a piece of the pie. Because it really makes a difference, really, I'm telling you. And you know what, since I changed and started doing that, I work my ass off. Because before that, it, there was no incentive. There's an opening there, you know, you know, you know, Shirley's sitting there doing her nails and somebody cancels and, uh, you know, I have two more fingers to do. I don't think I can fill that spot, you know. But if, hey, my bonus will go up, I'm getting, hey, it just, it works for everybody. Okay. So everybody's got to be on the same page. I had a dentist contact me. He hired a hygienist. And while the hygienist is cleaning the teeth of the patient, okay, she's going, I really don't believe in this mercury crap. You know, he goes and takes these courses, comes back. The ADA says it's okay. Uh, he, he, so he emails me and he asks me what to do. I said, I said, you can't. Either they have to totally embrace what you do or they cannot be part of the team. And there's no ifs, ands, or buts. And everybody in the office, now we do something different than role playing, and I gotta try that thing with, um, with, with the bean bags, I gotta go out, but you know what I'm gonna do, I'll get bricks. We'll, we'll, well, no, maybe the bean bags are better, okay. Here's what we do. I, 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 I now have an office manager, because I'm lousy at managing people. And one of the things I found is staff meetings. Now, Come on, staff. Aren't they wonderful, right? The typical staff meeting. When do you have it? Before lunch or f the Thursday or Friday before you go home? And my staff meetings were like this. <laughs> okay, and guess how much we got accomplished? Psh, nothing. So, every six weeks, I close the office. We work Monday through Thursday schedule. So every... Thursday, we work from, and we start early. See, we work Mondays and Wednesdays from 8 to 5 with an hour for lunch. And Tuesdays and Thursdays, we work 7.15 to 2 um, with no lunch. And so we have afternoons off Tuesdays and Thursdays. So we work from 7.15 to noon on Thursday, and then we close. 
and then we go to the restaurant, and I, this is the restaurant of my choice. Um, and they're allowed to eat and drink whatever they want. And when this first started, there were some ground rules. When we're out of the office, they are allowed to tell me anything about this dental practice. Okay? Anything. Boy, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. All right? So what happened is, we go out the first time. And everybody's sitting there and they're reading the menu and it's quiet. And I said, well, let's get started. And not much is happening until they each had a drink. <laughs> After the first drink, Dan, did I get it. Now, I'm not saying alcohol is a necessity here, but it sure helps in Cincinnati with my practice. Okay? So then what do I start here? And I say, you know, because how, how, how many dentists are here? Right? Do you book your own time? In other words, you know, the patient needs a crown. Do you write down the number of units of time you need? Okay? Right? I used to do that. And everything always would take longer than I thought. Or, or you know what I mean? I, I was lousy at determining the time. So the first thing they said is, you're, you really are terrible at that. Let us do it. You stay out of the book. We'll determine the amount of time. And we'll handle it. I said, we, we don't run late at our office. You know that. We do not keep people waiting. I said, oh, you won't. So nervously, I gave it over to them. And our production went up 30%. Because they know how to book it. When I, you know, because I always put in spare time for, you know, you never know when that cusp will break off, or you'll never know when this. Is. So I planned in calamity time, and they said, you know what, you don't need that. And they had more faith in me than I did, and we never run behind. Well, I shouldn't say never, because there's emergencies, but we rarely run behind. We rarely keep people waiting, and I don't look in the book anymore. I will. I come in and say sometimes I say hey, I'm a little nervous about this. I'll go to my office manager. I say, you know, that's kind of tight there. Shh. We'll handle it. So I just need her to tell her she'll handle it, and then I'm okay. But it works great. And boy, do I learn a lot about the practice, because they come in with notebooks. After the first drink, ah, okay. Remember, Mrs. Jones, the wording you use, because I'm very big, the neuro-linguistic programming. Body language, verbiage is incredibly important. So I don't know how they do this, like they high tape recorders, but they have every conversation I ever say to any patient, and they come up and say, remember that? I go, what? I don't, even, I don't know what day that was. I go, well, you said, say that, and you shouldn't say that. Remember, you said you don't use those words. And it's great. They keep me in line. They run the office. I, I, don't, want to run, I don't want to manage the office. I like doing the dentistry. I don't want to manage the office. You let Good people do what they do well. Right? Okay, this, Nestor? Huh? With me, Nestor? Huh? As a dentist, if you don't believe it, nobody else is going to believe it. And it's knowledge and passion that sells treatment plans. You know, and, and it's exactly what Sherry said. Before I figured this out, and I'm a little thick, so it took me about 17 years to figure it out, I did exactly what Sherry said. Your person comes in as an emergency, you take an x-ray, you look at the tooth, and it needs a crown. And I used to go in and apologize for it. Oh, man. I know this woman doesn't have a lot of money. You know, so already, what, I'm, what am I doing? I'm x-raying their pocketbook. So now I'm thinking, how do I approach them? Because I know they can't afford it. And I'm, I'm sitting doing all these mental, just, I don't do that anymore. Because what do I want to do? I want to give them the best possible dental care. So the old days, it was just like Tracy. And I said, oh, Mr. Jones, uh, man, that cuss broke off that tooth. And it's, you know, putting a composite in there, I really don't think that's going to be the best. You know, we should put a crown on it. When you have that approach, what do they do? They negotiate. Huh? Oh, come on. You can put a big composite in there, and then if it breaks, we'll go a crown. Right? They negotiate. How do you, you know, do you go, you're going to go in and get a, a surgery? You ever go in and, you know, dicker with your surgeon? You know what? Take three quarters out now, and we'll go back and take the other quarter out later. You can't have that frame of mind. You can't think that way. So now I go in and say, Look at that PA, look at that tooth. They go, Mrs. Jones, you know, you broke a cusp off that tooth. Is that bad? I said, well, you, you don't have much tooth structure left, but I'll tell you what. 
I can save that tooth by putting a crown on it, and I am 98% sure you won't need a root canal. No root canal? That's great. See, a lot of times patients, you see, you give them something, you, they're not going to get something they really don't want. And I got to tell you, that line works every time. They never then turn around and negotiate. No root canal. That's what you're going, I don't want root canals. I don't like root canals. I know he doesn't like root canals. 98% he's going to show me I don't need a root canal. Bam! Is he going to save the tooth of the crown? This is beautiful. They never negotiate. Remember that line. I'm telling you, that line works every time. But you can't use the line because it's attitude. You can't with the head down. You know, you have to say, guess what, Mrs. Jones? We can save that tooth. And you won't need a root canal. Oh, yeah! Who here does not use, because I know most of you do, intraoral camera? Why? Are you happy with your life? Do you want to make more money? <laughs> Are you single? No. Okay, we're going to get into the intraoral camera and why it's so important in a moment. You got to create the proper environment. Oops. Ooh, sorry. You know what? Think of it this way. You go into a restaurant. Tell me if I'm wrong. And you go into the bathroom. And it looks like somebody hasn't cleaned it in three months. The toilet hasn't been flushed. I mean, it is ugly. What do you think about the kitchen? Huh? You know what my staff and I do periodically? When's the last time you went and sat in every chair in your waiting room? It's amazing. You'll sit down and you, because you, you, right, everybody, we're creatures happy. You walk in, you do the same thing every day, right? You walk past it, you might straighten the magazines because that's part of your job, right? But you go and you sit down in the chair there and you see a big gob of gum hanging under the, the you know, the, the, the magazine rack. Did you ever you get in a chair periodically and lean back and all of a sudden you realize there's a drop of blood where you missed when you were disinfecting? How does it look to the patient? Do you, do, does it look worn? Does it look run down? How successful do you look? Your physical building is a reflection of who you are. The clothing the staff wear is a reflection of who you are. See, you're making a statement at lots of subconscious levels. If you have a successful looking, nice office, what do people think? You're successful. What if you have a dump? People think you're dumpy. It's worth spending, I'm telling you, you get it back two, three and four fold. Spend some money, put some new carpeting in, paint the place, new pictures, and you know what's fun? You have a staff outing. You take a day off and you send the staff out shopping to fix up the office. You know what? It makes them feel good. It's a team thing. Do I go? Hell, I hate to shop. But they have a great time. They got the credit card, right? And they go and they buy pictures for the wall. We hire somebody to repaint. And you know what? The place looks fantastic. They ordered some custom furniture. Our conference room looked dumpy. They made it into this nice, comfortable lounge where we see people for the first time. It's a reflection of who you are. And guess what? Team effort makes, wouldn't that make you feel proud? You all go shopping, you fix up the place, like fixing up your home. It makes you feel like a family. I tell them every day, we're like family. Emotionally, my, my, I will tell you unequivocally, my staff thinks this is the only place to work. They would not want to work anyplace else. Do you feel that way? If you're, the, if you're the employee, do you feel that way? And if you're the doctor, do you feel that way? And if not, you have to kind of meet. You got to talk about it. It should be a nice place to work. Hey, I'm with them more than their husbands are. Most of their husbands are pretty happy about that, by the way. And the, the last thing is, what are we doing? Are we a money machine? No. Everybody does believe we're here to help people and make them healthier. But it's only fair that we're compensated. And we should be fairly compensated. 
And it starts with a phone call, just like what Sherry was talking about. If you have Bev on the front desk chewing gum, um, she's not Smith's office, you know, what, again, what, what does that say about your office? Everybody knows what we do. Guess what? They've sat through my lecture several times. Right? They know it backwards and forwards. They can come up here and give this lecture. I mean the Thursday lecture. So if somebody calls, they know their stuff and they believe in it. Because we've been doing it long enough that they've seen sick people come back healthy and are thankful. And they like being part of a team that helps people feel better. So it all starts with the front desk. And if you don't have a people person, I guess what you need to do is you have to have a friend call, all right, and tape record some front desk conversations as a new patient, call as a new patient. And then you take them out and you have some drinks at a staff meeting and you play it. And boy, you'll catch boy, some grammar. Now I have a woman from Kentucky, we've been working on her. Okay. So, so it really helps. I mean, and you're not going to do this to try to chastise them. You're going to try to, it's sort of like role playing. Boy, when they hear themselves, boy, it's a lot different. So then everybody will sit there and say, you know, what's a better way to say that? And I totally agree with Sherry that, first of all, everybody expects to pay wherever they go. So my staff will say, how would you like to take care of this day, cash or credit card? Okay, it's a very nice statement. Which way are you doing it? It's not, can you pay today? Will you pay today? How would you like to pay for this today? Cash or credit card? When we're going to appoint them, and nobody ever leaves without an appointment, because we're going to schedule them for six-month cleaning or for their next restorative appointment, so they always leave with an appointment, and you don't say, when would you like to come in? You give them two choices. The doctor has time on Wednesday or Thursday. And they might go, oh, geez, you know what, Tuesday's the best day for me. Let me see what I can do. You know what, I'll get you in Tuesday at 2. Would you? Thanks. All of a sudden, they're appreciative you've done them a favor by getting them the time they want. See the psychology behind that? It's beautiful. I think it's beautiful. Okay. okay. When a patient calls, they explain about the practice because, as you know, 99% of practices, when you call, what's the first thing you do is clean teeth. You know, set you up with hygienists. That never happens in my office. I always see them first to talk with them. So it's very carefully explained to them because most of them are used to coming in and getting their teeth cleaned at that appointment so they make sure that these people are clear on how we do things. Now, at this point, it's not so much of a problem because our reputation is large enough that people are calling because they know what we do and they want it. And it's nice to get to that point. And as we were saying, most, you know, like with the yellow pages, most, it's density appropriate, meaning that most dental offices, it clusters that within the five miles you have the most patients and then within 10 miles and it gets thinner and thinner. Most biological dentists, it's, you know, I have patients four or five hours away. And what's a little different, of course, is we'll get patients that will come in for all their restorative work but then go back to their dentist because it's too far to come for just cleanings. And I'm okay with that. But we still put them through this exact same program we're talking about. So they get, all the, they get all the information and they enter the insurance in the computer. This way it'll give them a chance to look up or find the insurance company, find the plan before the patient ever comes in. Then a health history, eventually on our website, they'll be able to just download um, a map and download the health history. Right now we mail it to them for the welcome letter. Okay. So they're instructed and reminded the day before to make sure and bring in your health history. What doctor here likes to stand there and wait while the patient fills out the health history? No, we don't like that. So they're very good. Very rarely does a patient forget it. It's mailed to them. They're reminded the day before. If they somehow lost it, we'll fax them another one. And very rarely do I ever have to wait for somebody to fill out the health history. Day prior to the appointment, like we just said, everything's confirmed. We make sure they bring their forms. 
Now, the first visit, patient comes in, is nicely greeted, okay, um, and greeted right away. You don't let somebody come in and sit and sit and sit without some kind of eye contact. And you don't greet them through the glass, right? Is this all good stuff, Sherry? Sherry, she, see, I know I'm okay. Cause she, see, I'm nervous because I've never lectured in front of Sherry before. You know, I always listen to her practice management, so, that she's, so, so at least she's shaking her head. You don't say hello through the glass. You open the glass. And guess what? You should know what their name is. Hello, Mrs. Johnson. How are you today? You know what? We'll be right with you. Get comfy. Okay? Nice personal greeting. Okay? Quickly. Just like the phone should never ring too many times. Okay? Now, when they come in, I will see them in the conference room. First thing. And what is sitting there is a, a sample Panorex, sample bite wing x-rays. There's the dentistry, the dentistry book, you know, I always like, I have a picture of the uh, dentistry without mercury. There is an academy brochure. We happen to do that. Have you guys heard about the Visalite thing? We're, we're, we're in a Visalite office. So, so there'll be a pamphlet about doing the oral cancer scan. And I, ha I read their health history before I come in. I don't read their health history in front of them. So they're sitting in the office and they're looking around and guess what? It's cozy. It's nice. It doesn't feel like a dental office. The brain is fresh. Nice new pictures. So I'm giving them a minute to kind of say, oh, this, this, this is pretty good. And of course I have my IOMT plaques on the wall. In fact, I wanted to put everyone I had up there and the staff wouldn't let me. They said, that's a little much. So every once in a while, I buy a stand and I sneak one up on a shelf. And then they catch me, take it away, and I put another one up. But that's another story. And I come in and I put their health history down and I shake their hand firmly, look them in the eye. A lot of, even women a lot of times will stand up so I have them sit down. I sit down and I say, Mrs. Jones, what brings you here and how can I help you? And then I don't say another word till they finish, ever. And they will give me their dental history, why they're here, what they're looking for. I will take notes. I try not to interrupt them. Sometimes I'll clarify something. Most people are not used to that from any health professional, but let alone a dentist. Because what are they used to? They see the hygienist. Dentist pops in and says, hmm, you need a crown here and a filling there. We'll, we'll schedule that for you. It's very nice meeting you. Right? And they're out of there. Who has time to talk? I hear that all the time, that nobody's ever taken time like this to talk with me. Very important. I will go over their medical history first, not their dental history. Why? Because we're looking at the whole body. And their whole body is important to me. A little psychological thing, but I always go over their medical history first. Then we'll go on with their dental history. And then I explain to them what we'll do. I say, today is, is data collection day. And I have my computer sitting there because we take intro all pictures, okay? And most people think I have a picture of a mercury filling on there. I have a picture of bleeding gums. Because most of the people coming already know they want the mercury out. But they're not thinking about bleeding gums. And the American Dental Association even says, over 90% of people's, over 90% of people have gingivitis, so it means when you're probing or cleaning your teeth, they're going to bleed, and 75% have bone loss. So, one of the things is, if I'm going to take mercury out, even if I'm never going to see them again, you know, that's a patient from five hours away, I'm not taking mercury out if their gums are bleeding because the mercury vapor will go in through their cuts in their gum tissue. So we're going to work on the gum tissue first, whether they're going to get a cleaning with me or not. So I, I tell them that. I say, you know what? We're going to, and, and as you guys know from Thursday, I probe them. Part of their exam is I probe them. I do the periodontal probing. And I know we can argue about David Kennedy, and, and I totally agree with him about killing the bugs. But I just handle things a little bit differently. I want to know pocket depths. I want to know if they have any lost bone. And I want to know that before I treat them periodontally, before we let the hygienist loose on them. All right, I want to diagnose before we treat. And when you tell patients that, they go, wow, why doesn't anybody tell me this before? And they say, well, you're used to traditional dentistry. This is biological dentistry. Okay. 
So this is all the things I was talking about. Everything I'm going to talk have there. Okay. Sorry, actually, I had that up there. Then you guys know the blood pressure story, right? Does everybody know the blood pressure story? Anybody not know the blood pressure story? Okay, you got to take blood pressures. Okay, you know the little Mr. Manson story where he was going to die and he got saved, okay? You got to take blood pressures. You're a doctor. It's your duty of care to do this. You know, like everything else medical legally, let's say, God forbid, you give somebody some lidocaine with epinephrine and they have a heart attack and they decide to sue you. And the opposing lawyer, right, says, did you take a blood pressure? Did you know he had high blood pressure? You would pick him apart, wouldn't you? This man would pick you apart. <laughs> but he's nice about it. He's our academy lawyer. That's why I'm razzing him. Okay? So, so you got to do it. You have to have a good health history, and you have to have a blood pressure. And that protects you medical legally. But you know what? It's just the right thing to do. And, and people appreciate it. Do you know how many people I walk out of the room and they say to the dental assistant, you know, no dentist ever took my blood pressure before. That's very thorough. What's it making statements about? Wow, this office is really thorough. Okay, then I explain to them, I'm a checklist kind of guy. Like a pilot. That way you don't miss anything. Pilots, yes, we don't want pilots to miss anything. I don't want my dentist to miss anything. And like we talked about, I did talk about this a little bit on Thursday, but I have my dental assistant go through a very thorough checklist. Do you think I know the checklist by heart? Do you think I could do it in 15 seconds, you know, real quickly? No. But see, we're setting a precedent. We're making a statement psychologically. So she says, lips. And I say, we're going to check your lips. I'm going to look visually, but I'm also going to feel to see if there's any little lumps or bumps. Palette. I say, I'm going to take a look at your palate. And I said, I'm going to, and then, you know, you make the little funny. So I, I feel around the palate and said, I'm trying not to tickle you. And then most women laugh. The men don't laugh, but most women laugh. And then I take my mirror and I ask him to say, honestly, I'm looking at your soft palate. And I said, everything looks good. And, you know, my dental says, and we go through this extensive checklist. Well, guess what the, guess what the patient says when I walk out of the room? Nobody ever examined me like that before. So then I'm taking all kinds of intraoral pictures, and, I, I'm t and I'm talking about abfractions. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, most abrasions you see in teeth, okay, we're talking about gum line recession. If it is truly toothbrush abrasion, it's going to be V-shaped. That's from the getting there and, okay. But you know, if you go home and look, you're going to find that the recession and most of the areas are dished out, moon-shaped. That is from grinding and clenching. The, you have a hard, now remember, teeth are attached to bone by ligaments, so yes, you can loosen the tooth from grinding and clenching. But what you're seeing most of the time with recession and root abfractions is they're doing things in their sleep and they're rocking that hard crown on that soft root and that's what's causing them to lose the complex. So if it is kind of rounded, it is not toothbrush abrasion. So I'll, I'll take pictures of that, and I'll explain it to them while I'm doing my exam. And they said, oh, and uh, I hear this every time. Oh, they, my hyg old hygienist told me I just was brushing wrong. Well, it's not what that is. And we make them a night guard. Because they said, well, how do we fix that? And I said, well, you don't need any fillings or anything there now, and, and, but you're, you're weakening the tooth, so we want to protect that. And I explain why we need a night guard. We make a night guard for 80% of our patients. Is that a good thing to do? Yes. Is it easy? Yes. Is it a revenue generator? Yes. But I'll never do something to just generate revenue, ever. And guess what? Our, we charge, I think, uh, I don't know, I, I don't want to get into prices because around the country it's so different, but our night guards are less than the average night guard in, in our city. I do the full period charting. I'm taking pictures of their teeth. I'm uh, take, talking about them. Then what I tell them is, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're finished for today. Well, uh, first thing I say is, and I make a little joke, and I said, it's, it's showtime. We're going we're to look at the pictures. 
So I sit them up, make sure my gloves are off, my, my um, you know, uh, magnifiers are off, wash my hands, sit down with them, nice and cozy, and we sit at the television screen, and I go through all the pictures. Okay? And I'm telling you, it, if, um, I might not, I might have uh, pictures, but it, when they see a big old mercury filling blown up 16 times, right, and mercury's all over, and they have one little custom sitting up there, they're not going to argue about a composite or a crown. A picture is worth a thousand words. People seeing their own bleeding gums, you know, you can show them a generic picture of bleeding gums, it's not the same. When you bring it up on your TV screen and you're sitting there 12 inches away with them, and they're going, that's me, isn't it? And I go, that's you. That's not good, is it? I go, no, that's not good. And I said, you know, if you, I took my little probe and I kind of went up and down your skin like that and you started to bleed, I bet you'd be upset. Well, how could it be okay in your mouth? There's 450 types of bacteria, trillions and trillions. They're going in and out of your body through those little open wounds. It's the worst place to have open wounds. What do we do about that? Can we get rid of that? Yes. Fortunately, you only had ones, twos, and threes. It's just inflammation. We're going to fix that for you. We'll help you. We're going to take you to a whole new level of oral health. A new level of oral health. That sounds good. I like new levels of oral health. Right? If they pick up you're really passionate about what you do, you never have to sell a car. You know, it's like I hated being a car salesman, and when I wasn't good at this practice management stuff, that's what I felt like. I felt like it, it was like pulling teeth to sell a crown. It's just a pun. All right, no, here's what's happened, okay? They've come in, I've sat down at the desk, I see them first, explain what we're gonna do, then they go in, get their blood pressure exam, then when I'm finished with the exam, they'll get any x-rays they need. I'm telling, we looked at the picture, photographs, then I say I'm gonna write up a written report. And we're gonna get you back and sit you down for the written report. Usually at that time they'll say, well, when do I get my teeth cleaned? And I'll say, I'll tell you what, if we cleaned your, you know what I went in with that little probe and you bled? Imagine if the hygienist used a sharp instrument. She would be pushing all kinds of bacteria into your, into your system. So what we're going to do is after the consultation we have together where we go over everything and I'm going to explain why you're bleeding and why that's inflamed, then what we'll do is we'll have somebody go over the techniques we'll, we'll design for you and you're going to heal your gums before we clean your teeth. And guess what they say most of the time? Nobody's ever done that before. That makes such so much sense. Yes, ma'am. The only way I will mot, not the beginning. Let's say we, what we'll do is after we instruct them, assuming they don't have periodontal pox, let's say there's just one, twos, and threes, and proper brushing, and some other things, and proper flossing, where we know they'll be in shape. I'll tell them within two weeks we can start working on removing their mercury. But this part of it never alters. Okay, yeah. You know, and we were talking about composites. I can't tell you how many really bad composites I see. You have to learn to do good composites. It's important, obviously. They can't be falling out. They have to look good. They have to be serviceable. They have to last every bit as long as an amalgam. And when, you know, a person comes in and they see something like this and it's sitting right there and you tell them they need a crown, they don't argue. I'm telling you, intraoral intra camera is your best friend when it comes to treatment planning. You all know about the dentistry without mercury. Um, I give it to every new patient. They go home from that first visit. Before th This is after I see them before the consultation. I ask them to read this. I ask them to read the informed consent in the back because I'm going to have them sign one similar to it. I give them a brochure from the academy. I ask them to go to my website, the academy website, and I want them to totally understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. Right? And on my website, it explains why we're doing everything we're doing. So they get to read it beforehand. So it's not a surprise. Dave, you missed the best part. It was fantastic, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
All right, this is the one the Academy has that goes out to colleagues to get them to join, but this is what we hand out. And as I was telling you, from a marketing standpoint, okay, you order this online, you know, to go to the Academy website, you order this online, get in engraved with it, whatever you want in there, and I order thousands and thousands, and it goes to every physician I work with, it's in every health food store, you know, the staff carries it around and drops it off to anybody, you know, that we know that is into what we're doing, and it is a fantastic marketing tool. Materials reactivities test, we run that on chronically ill patients not on everybody and we kind of covered that on Thursday and I think that was it so now it's just any questions you guys have yes ma'am real, real loud what You're talking about co cover the fluoride? Yeah. Okay. First of all, um, let's talk about a couple things with, with respect to fluoride. I do understand that topical fluoride treatments are a wonderful moneymaker. Okay? But children swallow 40 to 50 percent of what you put in their mouth. Fluoride is more toxic than lead, slightly less toxic than arsenic, and it is a cumulative poison. Well, I'm trying to scare you, and then I'm getting to that. Okay. Okay, what I tell them is, no, you never have to be apologetic. Because up till, let's say, this conference, okay, you were using topical fluoride, right? Let's just say, you know, you were trained that way, it's the best thing since sliced bread. You look a patient in the eye and say, you know what, my doctor was so wonderful, they took me to this seminar, and I'm learning about biological dentistry. And you know what? Fluoride is bad. You know what? And this is what I say, did you ever read the side of a toothpaste tube? Because most people don't anymore. But it's changed. It says on the side of any toothpaste tube with fluoride that you look at, it says if a child swallows more than the size of a pea to immediately call poison control. I said, you know, I haven't read that in a while. And this academy, by the way, helped get that on there. And guess what the two, two, guess what the uh, Crest and Colgate, guess what their answer was to that? Because by the way, just a little aside, okay, an average size tube of toothpaste, if a 40 pound or less child swallows a whole tube of toothpaste, the amount of fluoride in it is lethal. Lethal. So what does the toothpaste manufacturer say? We are confident that there's enough additives in the toothpaste that the child will vomit before they get a lethal dose. <laughs> well, okay, I'm going to use it. Okay, so the point is, you don't apologize for what you did in the past because you were doing the best you can because you know what? You look like a very loving, caring person that tries to do the best they can. So you say, I went to this meeting and I learned, I learned the science behind fluoride. And we have now found out that that is not a very good thing to do for the kids, so we immediately stopped it. And guess what the parent will say? Thank you. All right? Just be honest. You, you came here, see, you can use this whole week as an excuse. Everything with patients, with amalgams, everything, say, you know what? We went to this conference, it was, but you've you got to be excited about it. You can't do the, we went to this conference and I learned that fluoride was banned. So we're not going to use it anymore. You know, you go, oh man, it, it was so cool. We, we learned, you know, they showed us these people bent over from fluorosis and, and, and you know, 51% of the kids have, have modeling of the teeth and you know what? I'm afraid the American Dental Association has been lying to us and so we're, we're, gonna, we're part of this new organization. And you just get excited and a person gets excited with you. Yes, ma'am. Are you stretching or do you have a real question? Or is it both? You say, I, I, and it's exactly what I say to him. You know what, at any given time, you know what, you're, I know you love your children. You, we always do the best we can with the given information we have. And now we have new information, so it's time to think differently. So you always, you never, it's never, oh, geez, you shouldn't have done that. Boy, are you an idiot. 
You know, you say, hey, you did the best you can. We were doing the best we can, but now we know better, and we want to do the healthiest thing possible. Yes, ma'am. Try to try to breathe that way when you ask. Um, what kind of procedures do you have that you use in your office and you do take out these amalgams? And do you take them all out at once, one side? Okay, I'm not going to go through the, the, the question was, I'm sorry, I have to repeat questions. The question was, how do we take the amalgams out? That was in the Thursday course, okay? That, in fact, that was what Thursday is about as far as the technique, if that's what you're asking about. Yeah. But, but as far as, yes, we basically will usually do quadrants. We usually do quadrant dentistry. Let's say they have a fair amount of posterior amalgams. We'll do quadrant dentistry. But one of the things I will say to them before the person comes in to talk about finances is I'll point to a quadrant because what I don't want to do is have that person do the, do the, you know what, let's do this one this month. And let's do that one next month. I say, that's cost prohibitive. We can't do that. What I'll need to do to keep your costs reasonable is we need to do a quadrant at a time. And most people go, oh, that makes sense. And I'll say, see how these come together? If we try to do one at a time, it's very hard not to nick the tooth next to it. And to do the best possible dentistry, we do quadrant dentistry. The only time I will violate that, and I will, is we're really sick people or really people that are really afraid. And I'll say, you know what, we're going to pick one little one and we're going to bring you in and we're going to show you how easy this is. So I will do something totally different for fearful patients or sometimes there's people that are so sick, I want to make sure, so we'll start with one, then we'll go to two and we'll slowly build up. So you're so, you're so sure that you're, you're protected. I am. You're so that you are so protected taking out these novels. I am. I mean, you are. The question is, do I feel protected taking out these mouths? Yes, I feel the procedures that I am using protect me and the staff and the patient. Because chloride, I mean, uh, chloride used to be okay and now it's not. I'm just wondering if... I've been mercury free since 1985. I've been honing this technique. And yes, I am confident. Yes, ma'am. Real loud, real loud. You on Thursday. Um, I, I work with my feet now. <laughs> the question was that mercury gets underneath the gloves. So what do I do? So uh, of course, being a smart ass, I said I work with my feet. Okay. Um, there is a scientific review for that. Ideally, what you would do is there is a special cream you can get that has a ton of sulfur in it, and you put that on your hands, and then you double glove with nitrile gloves. Double glove, double glove with latex. Mercury goes right through latex, mercury vapor. Nitro. Nitro gloves. It, it, it seems to be a better barrier. Do I do that? No. I would go nuts putting cream on and double gloving because, you know, you're going to check the hygienist, you're coming back in here, you're going, you know. So I don't. Should I? Yes. Do I feel okay? I don't? Yes. Yes. I am going through a detox program now. I am mercury toxic, but it's not for what I'm doing now. It's because I had a ton of mercury when I was a kid, and because the ADA lied to me, and I was putting it in and taking it out from 1977 and 1983. Yes, ma'am. Sure, she's saying, she, what she's saying, this young lady saying is, you know, you, 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 you say, look, we were victims too. You know, we had mercury fillings. We were placing mercury, you know what? And we're so happy that we learned the science. Fluoride. Yeah, the same thing with fluoride. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Real loud. You got to do it real loud. I have a question about something. Uh, he said that you talk to the patient and they'll be started on a period program. Yes. Um, what kind of Okay, first of all, I did a little study where I watched lots and lots and lots of people floss, and most people don't floss correctly. And I know it's not here, because remember we talked about this being the cerebral center of the universe on Thursday? I know the hygienist here will always review and show the patient how to floss properly. But guess what, in Cincinnati they don't. They say, you need to floss more. But they don't show them how to floss more. And guess what, in watching hundreds of patients floss, most people do not adequately go below the gum line. So what I do as part of my consultation is I have pictures there and I show them the anatomy of a tooth, I show them the attachment, I show them where the floss should go. And they go, nobody ever showed me that before. I tell them about streptococcus and the you know, streptococcus mutans and the plaque and I go through things and I 
I have not found one person that what David Kennedy was talking about, the research from the 1960s was streptococcus mutans and the plaque filling the cuff so saliva can't get in there, you know. Nobody, I have not found one person that knows that story from beginning to end. So I do it personally. So I give them a good visual picture of what they're trying to do. Okay, then somebody comes in and I love a rodent. Okay, anybody here work with rodent? Okay, the rodent has the most science behind it for plaque removal. They're the only company I know of that has a patented bristle because it turns out there's a, uh, there's a standard in the industry. Most toothbrush bristles are about the same size, whether it's an electric toothbrush or a hand toothbrush. And those bristles are too thick to get below the gum line. Rotodent Company has a patent on a bristle called a microfilament, and it's not much bigger than a few wisps of a hair, and you can bend it and get it below the gum line. So for the average person with just gingivitis, proper flossing and using the Rotodent is all they need to do. So somebody carefully goes over that with them. They use it for at least 10 days and then they can get their teeth cleaned. Is there a follow-up question to that? Uh, you're thinking about it? Well, 